Okay, so we are back. We are going to continue with chatbots, and today we're actually going to go over the code and kind of how they all work. So we've gotten the background behind them, so let's talk a little bit about what makes a chatbot actually work and what it's doing as a quick refresher. So you have a chatbot, and what it does is you feed it some input, and then what it will do is it will check its data set for that input. Maybe this is item one, two, three, and four. So it sees which of these, um, I guess, sets of text, I mean, it can be just about anything, uh, match closest to the user input. So once it finds that, let's say, for example, that it finds uh, that the input was closest to maybe input was approximately closest to number two. Okay, so then it goes to the, this is my input list or input file. Do it like that. And this is the output file. Okay, so then it comes to your output file and finds number two, and then outputs that. Okay, number two from the output file. So it takes the input, matches it, tries to match it with the input file. Then it takes that, whatever that number is, and outputs that item from the output file. So as a quick example, let me clear this up and then we'll go to a quick example. Let's say I have a list, maybe list is cat, dog, bird. Okay, this is gonna be my input list. So the input list, okay. And then I'm going to have an output list. And I'm going to match the output list entries with the entries that are in my input list. So maybe right here I'd say uh, awesome, good, and meh. Don't really care that much about birds. <laughs> that's, not, that's not true. They're both, they're also good, but I have to differentiate somehow. So. Now, the user is going to input, let's say, um, cat. Okay. So the output is going to be awesome. Then if the user inputs, we'll say bird. It will output meh. Okay. So that's the way that it works. It takes the user input, matches it to the input list. If it finds a match, it takes the item number, which one it is in the list. So this would be number one, two, three, and this would be one, two, three. And then it outputs the corresponding output number from the output file. So if it matches one, it looks for the very first entry in the output file and outputs that. If it matches a three, it takes the third element, the third entry in the output file, so the output list, and outputs that. Okay. So that's kind of an example of how it works. Let's actually see how it works. All right. So I've made a file. Let me clear this. And then we'll go to um, the actual code and watch how it works. So let's see, close that. Okay, so here we are, we are in Spider, and I'm going, don't worry about the code yet, I'm gonna go through it in a little bit. Uh, so what I've done is I've made uh, an input file and an output file for my favorite episodes from the Twilight Zone TV show, okay? 
So the Twilight Zone, this, this is the one that was back in the late 50s or early 60s, my favorite episodes of that. So let's see what we have here. First off, I'm going to start and run. Run, my gosh, if I had a good sense, that'd be dangerous. Alrighty, so my chatbot I've got here is, uh, made it sort of have a personality of something like Jarvis, uh, which is from the Iron Man movies. So it's asking me, how may I direct your query? So what can I ask it? I want to know what the number three entry is in my list of my top 10 list of episodes. So when I enter number three, it outputs the number three episode time enough at last last and it's got henry bemis loves to read but there are never enough hours in the day that is a very brief synopsis all these synop these little descriptions are what i wrote because i couldn't find any decent ones on the web so i just wrote them myself uh what about my number 10 so maybe the 10th one Alrighty. The tenth one is the monsters are due on Maple Street. A neighborhood turns on itself as strange events occur. Alrighty, uh, what about uh, the seventh one? It's a good life. Season three, episode eight. A neighborhood is held hostage by a little boy with godlike powers. Alrighty, and then maybe oh I don't know. Let's just put a six in and see what happens. Number six, changing of the guard. An older professor reflects on his life after learning he is being forced to retire. Alrighty. So, notice that I, when I entered in my value, I entered in the words number three, and it gave me the third one. The input was the tenth. It gave me the tenth one. Seventh, written out as an actual word, it gave me the seventh one. And just the number six gives me number six. So what did I do in order to get this to work like this? Well, let me stop this and go over to code. Oh, let's see. Okay, so this is just what the input text file looks like. So if the person inputs the number one first, first done out like that, number one, number one spelled out, or even the title, it is going to fetch the very first entry from the output file. So that's the same for every one of these. I have all that redundancy built in. So if somebody enters in number nine, all in words, it's going to output the ninth entry in my output file. Okay. So what does the output file look like? Well, let me pull that up. So this is my output file. I've got what I want it to print when someone gives it a value that makes sense to it. And it's going to print out if I do uh, number four, it's going to print out if I match up to the input, the fourth input, it will output the fourth entry, which is right here. I stop at Willoughby and then print out the full synopsis. Okay. So, that's what's going on behind the scenes. Now, let's take another look at what is happening with the code itself. So I'm going to go back to Spider. So here we go. Okay, so here we are back in Spider. I'm gonna come down here and I'm going to enter uh, something that has, it is not listed in my input file whatsoever. So maybe cat. And so since it didn't match anything in the input list, Jarvis says, I am unable to understand your directive. Um, what about, oh, I don't know, uh, nine. And that's the ninth one. If I do Willoughby, it does that one. Now, it never sees the output file when it's trying to match. All it sees is the input file. If I didn't have Willoughby in my input file, it would not know to output Willoughby, the, a stop at Willoughby from the output file. Does that make sense? Everything that the person enters must be matched on the input file only. Then it uses the number of the, the entry number that it matched with the input file to output that same entry number in the output file. And that's it. 
That's all it's doing. Alrighty, so let's go back to the code over here a little bit and start looking at what on earth is going on with this. Okay, so, oh, and before I forget, while I'm in here, I'm going to say goodbye. Goodbye. I am now powering down, engaging turret defenses. Alrighty. Now, every bit of Jarvis's personality, the input file and the output file, all has to be within this code or within the two files. So here are the greetings that it's looking for. If I type any one of these greetings, it will respond with something out of the greeting responses. Okay, it's bot ID is Jarvis. This is the thing that appears before it says anything. So you can change that to whatever you want. And it will do the normal response. Good afternoon. Noon, how may I direct your query? If it doesn't make sense to it, it outputs, I am unable to understand your directive. Okay. If I had input something like, thanks, thank you, cool, or awesome, it would respond with, you are most welcome. I'm now powering down, da 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 da. So, let me see something here. Okay, thanks. And then if you look at the goodbyes, if I type any of these goodbyes, it says instead of you are most welcome, it says goodbye. Now I'm powering down engaging turret defenses. Okay, so every bit of its personality is in these responses right here. You give it something that it can match. Oh, and that should be a match with that. So if it gets anything out of the greetings list, it gives this response. If it gets a normal response, it does this. Confused response, it does that. If you say thanks, it outputs this. If you say goodbye, it outputs this. Every bit of its personality is right in here, okay? Now, let's go down to the code because it is a doozy. This is extremely confusing code, but we can get through it. All right. So at the very beginning, the, where all of this power comes from is located right here. This one line does most of the heavy lifting. It uses something called cosine similarity. So I'm going to go back to the blackboard and talk about cosine similarity. So cosine similarity Cosine similarity. Alrighty. So before I jump into that, let me ask you a question. How is it determining whether or not a what a user inputs, whatever that is, matches something from the input file? How on earth can it determine that? Well, it does it with math. Okay, remember when we were doing the TF-IDF that it took every single one of the words inside of it, all the tokens, and it made a vector out of the list of tokens for your reviews. So it took your review, changed into tokens, and then changed those tokens into decimal values based on the TF-IDF of all of those tokens, right? So it changed your text into a vector. What did the vector contain? It contained TF-IDF values. Okay. Now, what the chatbot code does is it takes the user input as text and turns it into a vector using TFIDF. Okay, so this is exactly what goes on for the user input. It changes it into a vector and then has the TFIDF values. Okay, that vector is, is just a straight mathematical vector. There's nothing special about it whatsoever. Now, turns out 
that you can gauge the similarity of two text vectors by looking at how what is the cosine of the angle between those two vectors okay that sounds like a lot of uh, stuff to think about but turns out if I have vectors that are at right angles so this is a vector and we'll call this maybe I don't know a and this vector is going to be vector B if they are at right angles vector A has nothing in common Common, I can I can spell that. Common with vector B. So A is not equal to B, but it's not really equal to. What it's looking at is if when I take the two vectors and examine the cosine of the angle between them. That's going to give me an idea of the similarity because if I have, let me go to a little bit of math here. Uh, let's see. Let me clear this. Let's say I have A and B are vectors. Alrighty. The cosine of A and B, cosine of the, let me like this cosine of theta we just say theta and theta is the angle between a and b right you've probably seen this in cal 3 if nowhere else cosine of theta is equal to a dot b over the magnitude of a times the magnitude of B. Y'all remember that? So if A and B are exactly the same, A dot B is going to be A1, if you will. <laughs> if A and B are, there's nothing in common between them, when I dot them together, I'm going to get a zero. So if I think about it that way, if I get this is equal to zero, that means A and B are at right angles. Okay, they have nothing in common. But if A equals B, if it is exactly the same vector, then I have a situation where the cosine of theta is going to equal 1. So if it equals 1, that means that A is exactly the same as B. Alrighty? So what the cosine similarity is doing, cosine similarity, is it is taking two vectors a and b and checking to see what their value is if i dot them together and then divide by the magnitudes if that value is zero it means they have nothing in common if the if they are exactly the same vector it will give me a one as a result okay so this maps into something between zero and one some value zero means there is no similarity between the two vectors they are at 90 degrees of each other one if they are exactly the same vector okay so that's all cosine similarity is doing but that is absolutely huge because it makes our life really really simple alrighty so let me stop this and I will go back to the code so clear Okay, so right here, 
what this is going to do is it is going to perform cosine similarity on using a value, uh, some vector, against the entire array of all the vectors found in the TFIDF file. Okay, so it takes a single vector and then matches it versus all of the vectors and it will generate a list of all the cosine similarities that are stored inside of vowels. Okay, now once it does that, it basically sorts the list using this sorting feature right here and stores the index of the response that was the highest cosine similarity. Okay, so it stores that index, the number of the entry that matched closest. Alrighty, then what does it do? It generates, it outputs my text file, out text, sub index, the number entry that corresponded with the index that matched the, that was from the input file that matched the user input closest. Wow, that's hard to say. Let me try again with it simple. Using these two lines, it finds out which entry inside the input file matches the user input closest. It stores that entry number in this IDX. Then it goes to the output text file and outputs that entry, out text subindex. Okay? Now, that is it in a nutshell. Those two lines handle just about every bit of that. Okay? So, um, that would be really easy if that's all that's going on. <laughs> but there's a lot of subtlety that's going on in, behind the scenes. So if you want to just kind of jump into this and knock it out, all you need to know is the personality of your bot is all up here in these uh, responses, these greeting and then the, the paired responses. And really, these are both separate, so they shouldn't be grouped together. Okay, that's the personality. You then have to have an input file and an output file. Okay, down here, it's going to take the input, and here we go. This is so, so hard to explain. It will take the input, I'll come up here and just do this. It will then look for the input, which is going to be this one right here, and try to match it versus all the entries. Okay. Whatever one it finds, it will then take that index, that is the entry number that matched the closest, and then it will output the in the entry number of from the output text okay so if you want to just jump in change these values to change your personality and then go to your text files these two text files and change each of the entries now in order to be able to have multiple um, types of output uh, where you don't have to worry about commas or tabs or anything else um, i'm putting an at sign in between my entries you can keep it just like that but if you look at let me bring that back up i'll go to my input file every one of the entries is separated from each other by this at symbol so there's an at symbol after number the first entry second entry all the way down to the ninth entry I don't need an at symbol here because there's nothing to come after. I don't need an at symbol in the front because there's nothing that comes before. So same thing is found in the output file. If you look at it, it has the same characteristics. I've got my first entry. At the very end, I have an at symbol, at symbol, at symbol, at symbol, at symbol, etc. So it's able to figure out which entries correspond to which entries, input file to the output file. 
just by the first entry in the input file matches the first entry in the output file. Second entry in the input file matches the second entry in the output file. And so all you have to do is change personality and the items that are inside of here, and you're good to go with the chatbot. So that is, in a nutshell, what's going on. And if you want to just stop right here, <laughs> you can. But I'm now going to dive into the details of the code, the code that makes it work. The details that make it work, I should say. Um, there are a lot of very confusing details in this code, okay? Uh, until you run through it, and then you're like, okay, that makes sense. So I'm going to stop this, and we're going to pick up with the code, and it's going to be a really detailed examination of the code so that you can tweak the code if you want to make it do different things. You'll have full control over it, but um, it is very non-intuitive the first time you look at it. So that said, let me stop this and then we will start in on the code section. Okay, so here we are in the code. Um, I don't remember if I ended this one or not. Did I say goodbye? Yeah, I did. Alrighty, so it's not running in the background, it's just making sure. Basically, the code itself starts right here. It sets a flag as true. What a flag is, is typically it's a value that either holds true or false. Um, it's called a Boolean variable. You don't need to know that, but I can change the when the while the flag is true. Right here, while flag equals true, double equals means equals. It will do this loop over and over and over and over. It stops doing this loop the second that the flag gets changed to false. So the whole bit of the code is to initialize the flag to true, print the initial greeting that the, the bot gives you, and then start in on this loop. And it this is this is all of the code that is run from here to here for the entire time that it's running in the background. Just this little bit of code, okay? So what is it doing? Well, it gets the user input from the screen. So the input that the person enters gets stored in user response, okay? It then changes the user response to all lowercase because I don't want to have to deal with uppercase versus lowercase. I just want to make everything lowercase, okay? And then it enters an if statement. If the user response is not in the goodbye list, which is up here, so right here. So if it's none of these, it then moves down to the next if statement and says, okay, then if the user's in thanks, comes up here to look for the thanks array. So if the user input is in here, if it is in there, in the thanks list, it changes the flag to false and then prints the, the bot's ID plus the welcome response, which is what goes with the thanks. It'll say, you are most welcome. I am now powering down engaging turret defenses, okay? But if it is not in the thanks list, if the user response doesn't match anything in the thanks list, then it comes down to here. If, here we go, greeting user response, okay, what is that doing? Well, that is calling a greeting function, okay, and it's sending in the user response. So it goes to the greeting function up here, and it looks at the response that the user typed in. If one of the words inside that user response matches one of the words in greetings, then it's going to return randomly one of the greeting responses. So if it anywhere in the user response, if it says greetings, sup, hi, hey, whatever, the bot is going to randomly choose one of these greetings. It chooses randomly, it can be any of them. Okay. So 
let's say that the greet the user response is not in the greetings list okay if that is the case it comes down to here and what it does here is where it gets strange okay <laughs> it's very efficient but it's strange so it hasn't been there wasn't a goodbye in the user input there wasn't a thanks in the user input and there wasn't a greeting in the user input so it then takes the user input and appends it to a variable called sent tokens okay now what is sent tokens well sent tokens is up here where I put where is it right I can find it there okay so when it reads in the input file it stores it as data one okay then it splits data one into a list based on that at symbol into sent tokens so sent tokens contains the input file that you you've typed in the list of inputs that you want it to match stored as a list that is split by that at sign okay so sent tokens contains your input file it is going to add the user response right here to the sent token so this line right here it appends the user response to sent tokens okay it then prints the bot id and this end equals and then there's an empty string here there's nothing in here it's not a space it's just quote quote what this means is at the end of the print statement there is not going to be a new line character it's just going to be waiting so that when the next print statement kicks in it prints right after the bot id it doesn't do a new line so it will print the bot id whatever the bot's name is and then it prints here we go response and then user response sent into it response is a function above it's going to be sent the user response and then it's going to print whatever that returns okay so this is a function and it gets sent in user response so here we go let's go to the response function the response function is where all the magic happens so it starts off it makes an empty string called bot response okay so it's just an, it's just waiting for characters to be added to it it then vectorizes the list of sent tokens now that list contains all of the input file sections everything you put in your input file as well as the user input that was appended at the very end of the list so you have your your input file entries and the user input at the very end okay so it's going to tfidf transform every one of those entries okay then it's going to run cosine similarity of the last entry in that list the tfidf vectors the last entry is what the user input that has been put into vector form because we added the very last user input to sent tokens so the very last tfidf value the tfidf vector is the vector that corresponds to the user input it then matches that versus every entry in the tfidf list including the last one which is itself so i'm going to briefly go over to the blackboard here and kind of draw what's just happened so when i initially called the function what i did was i took my sent tokens sent tokens that contained the input file entries. Okay. Entries. Yeah, like that. Alrighty. 
So, sent tokens contain all of the input file entries. I'm now going to add the user input or the user response, I think is what I'm calling it. Response. Okay. So the user response is now being added to sent tokens. So sent tokens now includes the original input file entries and the user response. Tokens. Okay. It looks something like this now. Maybe my input files were was cat, dog, bird, bind. Where the heck did bind come from? Hold on. Bird. And then whatever the user input. Um, maybe the in user input, I like dogs. Okay. So sent, if the user input that the user put in was I like dogs, now sent tokens contains cat, dog, bird, and I like dogs. Okay. The sent tokens list is going to be going through a TF IDF vectorization. And so it is going to contain vectors. Okay. So we'll call this vector A, B, C, and D. Okay. Notice the user input is also listed inside this list of vectors. Okay, it's the fourth one in this case. Alrighty, now we're going to run cosine similarity. Cosine similarity of, well, what are we doing cosine similarity on? We're doing that on TF IDF bracket negative one versus TF idea okay this right here is the tf idf file the object whatever you want to call it it is a list of the vectors okay so tf idf holds all of this the last entry because that's what when you do a list sub and then you do a negative one that means count from the end of the list backwards by one. So it is the first entry from the back of the list. So it is going to try to match TFIDF1, which is D, versus all of the items in here. So the entire list. So TFIDF list. Okay. And it is going to find the cosine similarity of all of them. All right. So what is this going to output? Well, this is going to output when he does cosine similarity, something that's going to look like maybe this. Oh, and I need to do another one around it because it outputs a two dimensional array. Um, so it's going to output, if you'll allow it, maybe a, there's no match at all between I like dogs and cat, a zero. Then it's going to output maybe this one is a 0.9 because it has dogs here and dog there. So it's some similarity, a zero. And then it's going to output a one because it one, you know, that's not going to be a nine. That's going to be maybe a seven. That's okay. Okay. So what it has right now is it has compared the last entry, I like dogs, versus every single one of the vectors. It gets a zero when it compares the vector of cat. It gets a 0.7 when it compares the vector dog, a zero with bird, and it gets a one when it compares versus itself, but it's the same vector. Okay, so now that we know what's in here, what happens next? Well, what happens next is, let me go back to the code okay so it stores that list of all of the matches that all of the cosine similarity values in this variable called vowels then the vowels list is sorted okay it's put in numerical order from least to greatest okay so this right here is going to sort the list 
and then it's going to find the index of, <laughs> this is so hard to say, it sorts the list, but it doesn't sort the, it doesn't have this right here, this arg sort is not sorting just the list, it's sorting the list and then providing the list of entry numbers that correspond to the items. So let me go through that one. I'm going to switch back to the uh, screen. Okay, so the next step, let me kill this, is we have IDX index gets vowels dot arg sort. And this is going to be an empty function call sub zero sub negative two. Okay. Now, the vowels list looks like this. It is going to be, we had 0, 0.7, 0, and 1. Okay. I'm now going to arg sort that list. Vowels.arg sort is going to sort this list. So it's going to sort the list, but it's not going to just sort the list. It's doing an arg sort. An arg sort is going to sort the list and provide the entry numbers that correspond to the sorted list. So when I do vowels.arg sort, what I'm going to get is, here we go, something that looks like this. Here we go. One, three, two, four. Okay. These are the entry numbers. that correspond to the sorted list. When it sorts this list, it would get, the sort would be, so the sorted list would be 0, 0, 0 0.71. But we don't want that. This numeric value doesn't do anything for me. What I want is which one of these entries is the one that has the closest match. So how do I do that? I do arg sort, and so it sorts the list, but then gives me the entry numbers that are right here sorted. So the first entry is a zero, so it's going to be the least. Then I'm going to have the next zero is entry number three, so that comes next. The next highest match was entry two, it's, it's right here. The next highest match was entry four. Okay. So these are the entry numbers. Okay. Now the index gets this. All this does is it sorts the list into this form. This means I want the very first uh, entry inside the, the two dimensional array. So this zero selects this. There's only one in here, but there could be multiple lists all in here. But it selects this one, and then it selects negative 2, entry negative 2 in this list. This value right here is, corresponds to negative 1. This value, which is 2 back from the end, is number 2, negative 2. So what it's doing is it's looking for the next to last entry number in the sorted list. Why does it want the next to last? Because the last one is always going to be a one because I'm using the last entry and looking at the cosine similarity between it and the whole list. It versus itself is always a one, so I don't want the last sorted value, which is always going to be the user response versus the user response, I want the one that comes next. I want 
2 back from the end of the list. So I want this value. Okay, so it finds the entry number and stores it in index. So index now will contain the entry number of the best match. Okay, entry number of the best match. Now we can go back to the code. Let me go back to the code. So, what does it do then? Well, it stores this in index. Then it does some other things, which I'll get to in a little bit. Then it comes down here and right here. The thing that it's going to return back to that function call is something called bot response, which was an empty string. But now bot response is going to be getting something in it. If it did not match anything inside the list, if the, the cosine similarity for the second to last entry was a zero, it has no idea what the user entered because it doesn't match anything in the list. So it does this confused response, which is right here. I am unable to understand your directive. Okay. But if it, if the second to last entry cosine similarity was not a zero, which means it matched it at least some, then it outputs the bot response which is an empty string plus out text sub index, the entry number of the out text. What is the out text? Out text is what I have from my output file that I read in and then split using the at symbol. So out text contains all of my, my output file data. And what is it? Which one of the data entries does it output? The one that matches the index. That is the entry number of the closest input match. So it outputs the corresponding output text. And that is it. So it outputs that uh, right here. And then as a very last step, it removes the user response from the sent tokens list. So it cleans it up so that you can do it again and not get a bunch of user responses gradually stacking onto the list. And then that's it. That's the whole part of the chatbot. It's very complicated <laughs> when you get down to it, but it's extremely efficient and elegant. Um, I had to study this code for about six hours before it finally clicked. If it doesn't click the first time, just keep going through it and thinking about what this has to do. It does cosine similarity of the very last vector in sent tokens versus the entire array of vectors for the sent tokens. So the user response versus everything in the input file plus the user response. It then sorts them from low to high and then stores the index of the next to last entry because the last entry is the user response versus the user response, which is a one. <coughs> so it then takes that index and then outputs that index, the entry number, from the output file. That's it. And I am now choking while I don't have any water next to me. <coughs> Should have done that earlier. But that's it. So I'm going to send you the code the, to the input file, the output file, and you can start playing around with it. Um, the next video will be actually changing the personality and the input and output files. Um, so 
play around with it a little bit. You can change personalities around. You can change what's in the input and output files. Just make sure you separate each one of the entries with an at symbol because that's what I'm splitting on here. If you want to, you can change that to anything you like. Just make sure that's in the input and output files to be able to separate the entries. Alrighty, I think that's about it. I will see you next video. Enjoy the code and have fun. Bye-bye.